So just a bit about yourself, you know, yeah. where did you come from? I come from uh, Rossville Street on the bog side, in over 10 Rossville Street, which is down at the bottom of the street. It's right where Bloody Sunday happened. I come from right in the middle of the Bloody Sunday killing ground, if you can call it that. And uh, I, I, I moved from there, sort of, oh, it's in Garton Square, sort of not far away, sort of. I seemed a big move at the time when you were a kid. Rossville Street and Garton Square, I thought they'd be foreigners. Mm. You know, it's a, a, and that's where I, I lived around this area ever since. I'm back loving, sort of. A, about a hundred, a couple of hundred yards from where I was born, and quite like that. I mm. uh, but I was sort of shaped by growing up, sort of in uh, in the bog side and going to school there and all the rest of it, sort of and going to some columns. So that's where, sort of the background to my general attitudes uh, uh, to life. I I think from an early age I would have been socially aware. Uh, I, to some extent, because my father was deeply involved in the trade union movement. I. He was the secretary of the local branch of the electricians trade union. Well, he wasn't an electrician, he was a labourer. I'm not quite sure how he got into the ETU. But, and he was in Derry Trades Council. And what some of my early, earliest memories, uh, you know, when I was five, six, seven, eight years old, we were with groups of men, there was always men, uh, uh, in the house. And they'd usually be sitting in the front room, the good room, the parlour, where mm. nobody was ever allowed except at special occasions. Well, people were sitting there talking, so that would happen. It's my impression that it happens sort of two or three times a week, but maybe it wasn't that often talking about trade union affairs. And they were associated with uh, the independent labour group, Stephen McGonigal and Seamus Quinlanderry, and who would stand for election against the Nationalist Party in the Bogside area all those years. My father would have been involved in that too. So that area of politics, labour and trade union politics. Mm-hmm. So I would have been, my, and my father was very interested in foreign affairs and so on. Mm-hmm. I mean, in our house, people used to be arguing about Archbishop Macarius of uh, 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 Cyprus and uh, the Shah of Iran being overthrown and then replaced sort of a, a, by a CIA coup. And things got we talked a lot around the street in those days and in our house. So I would have grown up with some understanding of the, of a political world outside. You know, sort of. I think that today people are more likely to be uh, 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 thrust into the politics of orange and green nationalism and unionism because that's what's to a greater extent than when I was a kid, are dominating uh, I, people's thinking. Mm. Uh, I, whereas was, I wouldn't have been the only person who was... There was a wider... I, in a funny way, I think there was a wider range of politics uh, available, if you like, sort of in places like the bog side then. Although we like to think of ourselves as much better on farm now, I actually think that there was a broader perspective back then maybe than there are now. More discussion about world mm. events. I th- oh, I think that there was. I remember sort of the, the media used to be very different. I mean, hardly anybody can remember now that there used to be foreign news on the front page of the journal, you know, foreign stories. And partly that was that you didn't have sort of uh, network television and all the rest of it. And uh, I, you know, national newspapers, so to speak, well, in the Irish or British national newspapers didn't circulate to nearly the extent that they do. Uh, uh, today, so newspapers tend to be cover uh, quite a lot. Uh, uh, no, the moon landings would have been front page news, and the local papers, mm. and so on. Now that wouldn't happen now, sort of, and it's uh, and it's meant that, you know, I, I think anyway, it reflected the fact that local affairs were more mixed up, sort of, with global affairs. Strangely enough, or in a way, in one way of looking at them, they were more mixed up uh, uh, with global affairs than they are today. Mm. At university, what were you? Like? Oh God, I don't know what it was like at university. It was a, a, a the university very different again. Like I had a grunt, you know. Sort of used to pay you to go to university. When you tell students that today, that not only did we not pay fees, they paid us uh, <laughs> to go and uh, you know your books free and all the rest. But mind you, you used to get the grant three times a year for the three different whatever they are the sessions or what are terms. Uh, Nearly everybody had the grant spent in the first two weeks or <laughs> every time. So I a drink mainly. Uh, so I don't, it, it, it was an okay time and I met a lot of interesting people, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, and, it's a, 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 and it was getting out of Derry. That was a big thing, mm-hmm. you know, no, not that I wanted to get out of Derry, but when you're 17, 18 years old, it's just about time that you want to experience somewhere else living away from the parents. So what was the plan for after university? Well, I never had plans. I'm, to be honest, I mean, I've, in most things, I've, never, I've stumbled from one thing to the other, and it just things will occur to me. I, I was working on, in, I worked on the roads for three years in England and, and the Gulf Plains and the M6 motorway, Preston to Birmingham, which I loved. Uh, uh, I, and so, but I, I, I mean, my whole involvement and in, like the civil rights movement and everything that sort of for the last forty-five years, 
uh, and it was just an accidental thing. I mean, I never intended to become involved in it. I was actually living in uh, uh, London, South East London, in Bexley. Sort of, I had a beautiful, wonderful girlfriend whom I loved, and uh, 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 she had four kids. I mean, I didn't, but they were. I had an absolutely good life. I was never uh, intending to come back. I only came back for ten days to see my sister. She was home from Canada, from Winnipeg, and I came back. And I remember I was walking up Roswell Street, and I met my old friend from childhood, Dermy McLennan. And we stopped and said, he says, well, he says, will you give us a hand? And he says, we're pulling this caravan out into the road to protest against the housing discrimination and the lack of houses for anybody in Derry. So with this person, John Wilson and Mary Wilson, were living in the caravan up a back lane, literally, because there were hardly any houses being built and Catholics were not being given houses and so on. So this was a protest and so on. So we did that. And then... For a few hours, then we decided when that didn't work, we blocked all the traffic, They're just talking around the way. So, a lot of people I didn't know will come back next week and do it again for 24 hours, which is all right. But anyway, then I had to stay for that, and then we were all arrested after that, so I had to stay for that as well. And the next thing I knew, I was phoning Olivia, that was my girlfriend, to, and I'm like, keep them putting it off and putting it off. And she's like, oh, come on, where are you? Well, I come over there. Uh, all right, right there. And, uh, and I never really went back to London. Mm -hmm. One thing borrowed another. Mm -hmm. Then there were different demonstrations and different meetings and rows and ructions and arguments and arrests mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So that was the entirely accidental way that mm -hmm. I became involved in the civil rights movement. So just briefly, you know, it's well trodden ground, mm -hmm. like, but it's really it's for people who don't know mm -hmm. uh, which issues created the need for a civil rights movement. I think that the, the you look at it in grand historical terms and say that it was, you know, that after partition you had you know two communities in the north and one was represented in the new partition state and the other wasn't and that that's the context and that's an absolutely accurate way of looking at it but uh, there are other ways of looking at it as well so not as alternatives but as well sort of additional matters and the whole uh, a economic dimension of it uh, as opposed to the political and ethnic and communal di uh, a dimension i think it's very important indeed uh, they had the, the, the issues of housing and jo houses and jobs were uh, absolutely central to the emergence of the civil rights movement because they're common throughout the world. People need, you need shelter uh, 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 and you need sort of money to live. I mean, houses and jobs are absolutely there. Uh, and there were very few jobs in Derry uh, and not enough houses. Derry Corporation, because of, because of discrimination and the way the council was uh, elected, a minority of unionists were able to get a majority of the seats uh, on the council. And they did that by manipulating boundaries. So that was the main mechanism for it. And that meant that the union, and because only householders had a vote, uh, it meant that if you gave a person a house, you gave them a vote. Mm -hmm. And of course, the unions party had to be very careful who they gave a, a, a houses to, and because they didn't want to give them votes. And that therein lay the connection between housing deprivation, sort of living, sort of a 50... We were actually quite well off, sort of, in Russell Street. There was, a, a lot of times, there was eight of us. There would have been my mother, my father, five a, children, sort of, and uh, there was me, Auntie Kathleen, and sort of, who, a, a, who at times would have been living there as well, and the two up, two down house. Now, that sounds very, by today's standards, I think it probably sounds very crowded, but we were not by no means... The, the most on the on the top end of overcrowdedness, sort of in places like uh, Russell Street, Union Place, Palace Row, Eden Place, all our whole area, Fox's Corner, Wellington Street, our whole area was just jam packed with people, and uh, I and everybody was aware that uh, one of the reasons, at least, that they didn't have houses or adequate houses and they didn't have jobs had to do with a political situation. So when you began to campaign simply on those economic uh, issues, it wasn't like a Dublin or London or somewhere where you could fight it. You very quickly in Northern Ireland came up against the whole question of the state, you know, uh, the nature of the state, sort of, and its discriminatory nature and all the rest of it. So it wasn't just that it was, uh, you know, we had, as Colin said, of course, I mean, I, it wasn't a religious thing. If you weren't a householder in a Protestant, you're right, you didn't have a vote either. A lot of people in the fight, and this is often forgotten, living in the fight, didn't have a vote, you know. Uh, I, and the thing, but it, it, it was it was an unbalanced uh, situation, and that made it very difficult to get at the heart, sort of, of the economic problem. I can remember a leader of the Nationalist Party in Derry before civil rights when I was a kid, standing in Cable Street making a speech on the night before an election. He's a businessman, and I remember him shouting about uh, somebody was getting heckled, sort of, from the going by some younger people and so on. 
about jobs and houses and why the old Nationalist Party are useless at uh, dealing with that. And he actually said, the people in the middle of the box say, this business man, said, we don't want their jobs and houses, we want our freedom. And everybody's here. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, sort of. Now that, I, I remember sort of thinking, and that taught me so often about sort of nationalism. And you have to be very careful when you're talking about when I think of the wrongs of nationalism, not to conflate it with the nationalist people. You're talking about nationalism as a political ideology, which I think is useless from a working class uh, point of view. Sort of, and that was uh, an example of it. So we had, we had a big tangle of politics here. It was never as simple sort of as anybody thought it would be. There were people on the labour movement at that time who thought, well, just ignore the orange green thing. Just ignore it. Mm-hmm. And that's the way to deal with it. And then there were other people sorry, who were nationalists and unionists to say, no, you have to deal with the orange green thing first. The DHAC mm. made up the Republican Club and Labour left, is that right? Aye, aye, aye. Uh, most, but most, the, most of the people in the Derry Housing Action Committee were not members of anything. Mm. You know, there were people, Johnny White, for example, who's a good friend of mine from the day that he died. Johnny was. Uh, would have been the leading light in the James Connolly Republican Club and Derry. And Johnny, you know, uh, <coughs> Johnny was far more a socialist than he was a Republican. It, 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 again, sort of when we think of Republican clubs sort of back, say, in 1967-68, we tend to think in the perspective of today mm-hmm. as to well, what, what that, uh, uh, that meant. There was nobody, I mean, there was no, there hadn't been any gunfire or anything sort of in the previous few years. I'd say we were talking in 1966-67. And so it was quite a quiet time, sort of, and people like Johnny had, I mean, uh, uh, were actually looking to involve themselves sort of in masses or the masses of people sort of in protests and uh, a strategy of getting people onto the streets was a very different thing from an armed struggle strategy. Mm. You know, it's a... a you know, so uh, so the people who would have been involved in the housing action, the Dairy Housing Action Committee, certainly there would have been members of the Labour Party, Young Socialists, of whom I would have been one, and Johnny, and uh, people from the uh, Republican Club, but other people like Emil Locke, uh, Bridget Bond, Paddy Kirk. I mean, sort of some of the people who were most active, sort of, uh, in the Housing Action Committee were involved in housing. That's what's been told me, I mean, as the name of the organisation implied. It wasn't a front, it genuinely wasn't. You know, sort of most most people nowadays would be suspicious when they hear something like a housing campaign. Who's running that? Mm-hmm. You know, who's behind it or which faction really has got that one? And they're right that happens. There wasn't that sort of a situation then. It was just all about the subject uh, uh, about housing. All the divisions were to come later, sort of under the impact of events and so mm-hmm. forth. But it's uh, they, they, our demands were in the Housing Action Committee was that we wanted a crash programme of building houses. 1967, Derry Corporation built no houses, zero, sort of in an area sort of where there was a massive housing need, I mean, desperate overcrowding and illness uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, they built no houses at all. So the first thing we wanted was build more houses. And secondly, fair distribution. We wanted a point system for the allocation of houses. And those were the things that brought people together. Now you could be fighting for housing on that basis uh, and still believe in the union we Britain and very I can remember you Adair, the trade union leader and so on Yule was very active at that time you came from new buildings and so on I remember other people like that sort of who were in their sort of a fight in a way or you could be a, you know a sea green republican sort of at a at the and still on the housing issue, be working well together. Now, I wouldn't exaggerate the extent to which it bridged the divide and so on, but certainly the Housing Action Committee was not confined to one community uh, I or the other at the time. And people, naively, when you look back on it now, people like myself believe that here we had the answer to the age-old communal division. So that if we just kept on the housing, just all the economic things we could uh, sweep over the sectarian divide. Now, mm. this, as I say, turned out to be a somewhat naive hope, mm. you know, but it's, uh, but it was under, because there wasn't sort of fighting and there wasn't, and there weren't people in prison and all the rest of it, all the rest of the pain of the troubles, it seemed a reasonable thing to believe at the time. But, uh, I w- am I right in, in thinking in the broad sense, was to, you wanted to create a political chaos. Mm. Um, the London Dairy Corporation was a prime target mm-hmm. and disrupt meetings and, and businesses. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we were out to, these colonies said, we were out to disturb the political peace. Well, the whole situation had been one in which the, 
last, you know, they, well, yeah, yeah, majority certainly of uh, Catholic people voted nationalist, and so uh, the hopes for change were opposed on the nationalist party, and the way we saw it at the time, uh, and I would still see it, is that they were useless, that this business of going, you know, quietly, and re well, not respectfully, but even sort of going, sort of acting in a constitutional manner. Who was that, sir? The nationalist party, who were the leaders of this area, yeah. Eddie McIntyre here, and mm. Tom Gormley, and Paddy Gormley, and... A, a, a lot of them that they were uh, going up to struggle and they were following the rules they were proving themselves worthy sort of of being treated equally mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a rather abject uh, way to, appro uh, to uh, approach things uh, and we were out yeah, I remember we're talking here 1967-68 I mean somebody would be at that age you know I I had been through when I'd been working in London and all the rest of it and even travelling it was easy to travel over to London it used to be two quid to go from Aldergrove to London, and even with the inflation alert for it, it was a small amount of money, which almost anybody could stand by fares. You just lowered, uh, uh, went up, and it was like getting a bus. Uh, you know, a, 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 and through that, I was involved in the anti-nuclear anti, anti, anti war movement, sort of the Vietnam War movement, solidarity movement, sort of which see various anti-colonial struggles going on around the world, sort of a very heavy student uh, presence and all that, sort of, and the, 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 this was the, the days of, you know, a, 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 a Alabama, sort of, and Birmingham and Montgomery and all that, and the Black Civil Rights Movement, sort of the and the, the, the Vietnam War demonstrations, which are absolutely huge at times. I spoke to over 150,000 people in Grosvenor Square in London at that, that time. So, and it was you know, the old street fighting man, sort of the, the, the song. And stuff. That's what it was. And that was not just in Derry, like that was all over Europe. Mm. Sort of there was a sort of student uprising, there were far, far more the people. Paris and all that. All that. Right. That affected the way people were thinking. And, a, 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 and it uh, a meant. Sort of that we saw ourselves when we saw Northern Ireland, something bigger, sort of the a that was actually happening uh, uh, across the world. Sort of was that a, a, so our idea was we were there to disrupt the political peace. It wasn't just in the north. Mm. Uh, at that time, there was an international movement of students and radicals of mm. various kinds again to disrupt the global capitalist system. So mm. definitely, we were out to disrupt things. Right. And, and your the, the chapter of the book too. It seems to say that a few a few group is going to be dismissed. Some mm -hmm. people would just dismiss you as that you were communists. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. mention that? Well, about? why we were always I made people accusing us of communists. I was always felt strange with people because we had to defend ourselves against the allegation we were communists. But because when it came to things like the Communist Party, Orthodox communism, and Moscow and all that. You know, not only would I have been a hundred percent opposed to all that stuff and opposed to Stalinism and the fact that there was no democracy in the Soviet Union, it was a dictatorship. You know, sort of society built like a barracks. You know, so I had no sympathy with it uh, <coughs> whatsoever. But it was very difficult to get that. It still is at times mm -hmm. to get that across. You know, because uh, what was happening is that the people somebody got up in Russia and they claimed to be communists. But it wasn't only really that, their opponents in the West also said they were communists and they were having this argument, mm. communism and anti-communism. So if you were standing on the side, like say, hold on, hold on, we are the real communists right. over here at the side, it was a very difficult argument to did make. You, did you, would you say that you were what Karl Marx wrote? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's not a Soviet communist. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'd be a, a follower of Marx and Lenin and Trotsky, and it's a, it was in the divide between Trotsky and Stalin, sort of, that I would have taken a stand, you know, sort of, a, a, with Trotsky, I believed it was a proper revolutionary, believed in revolutionary democracy, and all the rest of it, uh, uh, as against Stalin, who became sort of the orthodox leader, sort of, of leader of a big, powerful country, mm. you know, his philosophy, uh, one out, but oh yeah, I regard I am a communist. I regard myself as a communist, and uh, uh, he, so when we were accused of being communists, I always felt very awkward. I mean, do I defend myself here and say how mm. dare you associate me, me with Joseph Stalin and all that, or uh, or I did I say should I say yes, I am a communist. I'm just a wee bit more left wing than mm. people in Russia. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the big differences between you know it's a long time, it's fifty years almost, you know, or it is fifty years between when I was rampaging around these streets and now, it's uh, uh, it was easier then. It was definitely easier then. Uh, I, there was a everybody just assumed then that I, the next generation was going to be better off. 
that we, when I was a kid, which assumed by everybody, we were going to be better off than our parents. And so it turned out to be because just the rising economy and all the rest of it right across the Western world and so forth. And when things are getting better, you can have campaigns and sort of quite vigorous fights, you show, because you want your fair share of the extra that's coming mm. along. But when things are tight, when things are not getting better at the moment, in 2016, things are getting worse and going to go on getting worse. Mm. I mean, there's going to be more poverty, there's going to be more you know, family breakups and all that. The homelessness is going to get worse. And we know that because the budgetary forecasts are there and the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the economic crisis can't be uh, uh, denied. You, get big, you don't get big demonstrations, really, it's my experience, sort of when things are desperate, when people are desperate. You get big demonstrations when people think they're being treated unfairly, but they can do something about it. Then they're out to the streets, Let, uh, let's do it. If you think you're being treated unfairly, and it doesn't seem there's anything you can do about it, that sort of, a, you get a sense of futility about it. That can make people turn in on themselves and all the rest of it, but it doesn't lead people to, anybody marching on the streets and all of that, must have some sort of optimism about them. Do you think that the two day civil rights movement back then mm-hmm. has been somehow, has it forgotten? Or, or has mm. it become part of our, so we have black America. Mm. That's still a big thing, you know, yeah. you get films out every year, Selma yeah. last yeah. year, yeah. And you get, you get the, but here it seems to be, Civil Rights Day, you think John Hume rioting, mm. that banner going down the street there, you know, mm. Civil Rights. Aye, aye, aye. Um, that's why I was asking mm. you about the and we we details about mm. you and, and it's not questioned or talked no. about, I don't think. No, well the, the, I think I wanted you know, the, the I think it, I mean, history, parts of history just get clouded over because something which seems more exciting and so on, more dramatic and all I comes along. There is among people uh, I, of the generation after me, or even the generation after that, uh, uh, I, they actually have got it into their minds and they understand why this would be the case. And what happened here in Derry and in the North is that you know there was discrimination against Catholics in the 1960s, the Catholics rose up, the state attacked them, and thus they moved to republicanism, mm-hmm. and that's what it was all about. Uh, so, and that's not what it was all about. And I, I mean, the... the if you look sort of at age 68, 69, 70, 71, sort of in that uh, period, uh, I would think 72. I would think that a, a, to the end of 71, say, you know, sort of internment, I suppose, in August 71, with the big game changer and it sent events sort of spiralling in a different direction. But all the big gains that were made, I mean, for example, we got equal uh, a distribution of houses for a while. We got a, sort of a lot of houses being built. Uh, I mean, in Derry, sort of, I mean, the housing situation was transformed. So that was achieved by the civil rights movement. That was the, a, a, the disarming of the police which of course didn't last more than a couple of years because of the situation developed. That was achieved by the Civil Rights Movement. The disbandment of the B Specials were a sectarian paramilitary police force. Mm-hmm. That was achieved uh, uh, by the Civil Rights Movement. Anti-discrimination laws in terms of hiring and firing uh, at work. That was uh, achieved by the Civil Rights Movement. So that's often forgotten. In fact, it's almost always forgotten, sort of, and I would argue myself sort of, that more, uh, uh, as far as the ordinary day-to-day interests of working class people are concerned, as opposed to national aspirations and the rest of it. But in terms of the day-to-day economic interests of working class people, more was achieved by the civil rights movement than has been achieved by either people going to parliament or people going sort of and having an armed struggle. You know, uh, which are the two things that you know people argue about: armed struggle or constitutional politics. I would say politics on people power delivered more mm-hmm. than paramilitaries or constitutional politics. I still believe that. Think of thirty years of violence overshadows the civil Oh, absolutely, movement. absolutely. I mean, the thirty years. In fact, even just once again into right after Bloody Sunday, for example, and so forth. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is if you look at the Bloody Sunday history, the year after a uh, Bloody Sunday, the commemorative march was run by the Northern Ireland. The Bloody Sunday march itself was run by the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. Now I've heard young people out. They seem to believe that the Sunday, the Bloody Sunday March is organised by Sinn Féin or some similar organisation. Not at all. It's a North Ireland Civil Rights Association. Bridget Bond was the chair of the meeting, uh, sort of on Bloody Sunday, 
I, I, I and hardly anybody remembers who Bridget Bond was. Mm. You know, it was Bridget Bond who opened her unveil to the Bloody Sunday Monument. I see her name at the bottom of it. Yeah, uh, who was that? Why was she unveiling mm. this significant uh, Derry Monument? Well, that's why she was the main woman involved in all that. And there are other people they got here quite forgotten. Cathy Harkin uh, is a good friend of mine who was in the Labour Party. Cathy would have been one of the most active people in all the social movements, housing and edu and, and, and uh, employment and the rest of it. So all those efforts are largely forgotten. And it is true sort of that once the thing uh, a, became an armed struggle because of the way the state had behaved, then sort of the old ideas of republicanism took over. And that's natural almost, you know, because there had been that, it was tiny in the mid-60s, this steady strain of people who believed in fighting the British. That's what we did, did. An armed struggle against the British was the way forward. Now, uh, once the, the uh, state sort of brutalised the civil rights movement and so on, that began to make a lot of sense to people, mm -hmm. yeah. And there had been a tiny sort of tendency within local politics, say in 1967, uh, I got there. Four years later, so it was actually the dominant or becoming the dominant sort of form of uh, political thought in a place uh, like the Bogside. And in that situation, the civil rights movement virtually forgotten, mm. you know, or regarded as having been of no importance at all. You know, it's, uh, and so there's things about the civil rights movement that I think we need to rediscover. The idea sort of, of getting people in large numbers to do things for themselves and to come out and protest in large numbers, as I say, as opposed to shooting somebody or just mm. standing for election. So it's a, it's a pity it has, but yes, they, they suppose sort of when things changed as dramatically as they did sort of in the north of Ireland, you're going to get some forgetfulness about what preceded all this. Mm. What are you doing now? What's, what's your focus? What do you do day to day now? What, what are your issues now today? Oh, well, the, the issues that I'm dealing with today, so on a day-to-day -day basis, are much the same as I was dealing with then, sort of I'm in the Trades Council in Derry, so I'm involved in the trade union movement that's fighting against redundancies and defending people's wages, and also defending people who have been treated like dirt at work, because sort of as they're, uh, I, the, the decline of trade unions uh, overall and the new arrogance of employers has meant that people are very badly treated and humiliated uh, a, at work, including sort of at some jobs that you would think are middle class, and. Uh, and so on. So, I mean, some of my time, or bits of it, will be taken up sort of with advising people on and rec representing people in disciplinary proceedings and uh, tribunals uh, uh, and so forth. And it also sort of be involved in the anti war movement and dairy sort of focus about the Middle East and pro Palestinian uh, stuff and involved sort of in environmental campaigns. You know, for the, the no burn campaign, I mean, just to stop pollution of the air, to stop the pollution of the River Fahan, mm -hmm. from which we take a lot of our drinking water, uh, uh, just right at the present time, sort of that's requiring sort of a lot of uh, 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 energy and work and research uh, uh, to try and stop what's happening. I mean, we've got the scandal, the scandal sort of of the way of uh, illegal dumping sort of around Derry and, and over the border in Donegal is absolutely huge and very little is being done about it. So I'm deeply involved sort of in, in that sort of thing as well. So if you take it all up, I mean, I don't have a minute sort of where it is, but it's all bits and pieces like that. I mean, to do with housing, to do with employment, to do with uh, people's civil rights. And there's also the le what we call the legacy issues. I mean, I'm still very much involved in the Bloody Sunday uh, a campaign. I've written uh, three books and uh, about half a dozen pamphlets about Bloody Sunday and pre produced or helped to produce three television films uh, about it. And that still goes on. I think there's a lot of stuff which has still not been uncovered about Bloody Sunday, particularly about the involvement and the responsibility of senior politicians and military people, and not just the uh, uh, what Kipling called the poor bloody infantry, i.e. the savages, that's mm. to where he went into the bog side, and uh, murdered and wounded people. You know, I mean, bad bastards, uh, I, the whole lot of them. But I'll tell you what, they weren't on their own. No. They were sent in by somebody. They were given to understand you can do this. They were given the go-ahead to do it. And I think it's often vaguely even unfair, you know, about uh, putting individual paratroopers on a uh, trial if we mm. don't put the Minister of Defence at the time, and oh, Lord yeah. Carrington, and the Army top brass, Kitson and Ford and these people, so you've got off scot-free, mm. you know, sir. so there's an awful lot of work still to be done sort of on that, and then all people with other legitimate grievances arising out of the troubles, I mean, and, and that can be very time-consuming as well. I'm not complaining about the time that these things take, uh, uh, I am quite happy to it, but sometimes it, uh, it does pile up a bit, and if you're sitting at home sort of at half ten at night and you really want to 
watch the Coronation Street that you recorded earlier. <laughs> I mean, you still somebody on the phone talking about can I see him or blah blah blah. And now this here, you fuck off, you know, <laughs> you can't. That's all. Right. So it does piss me off at times, but I enjoy being busy. I really enjoy being busy. I would hate it if I'm not doing anything. I look around. What can I do? What can I do? There must be something I should be doing. So it's a uh, and it's too late to stop now. You know, mm. you know. No, no, no let up. No, I don't want to lie to it's, it's, it's not what you would call agony or an imposition, you know, sort of. A, a, it's just what you are and what you do. It's just what I do. As I say, it's just my habit now, you know, mm. sort of. A, 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 you know, sort of. And I find, you say, when people, and some down to you, I mean, I, a lot of people like Derry know me because I've been around that long, mm. you know, sort of. And, Stand on platforms and show you this other people. I mean, I honestly, if I walk from here to Guildhall Square, I guarantee you that at some point somebody will stop and say, Oh, what am I? Someone I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Sorry, and you start saying, Oh my God. But you can't say, I mean, tell people to yeah. F off. People are entitled to talk. And either it can be just a nice conversation, but you know there's a possibility I'm going to be dragged in this often here. <laughs> so this is going to take hours of work. But anyway, I said, uh, sure, that's grand. That's the way the world is. That's great, then. Thanks very much. Okay, man. Okay, you're very welcome.